Hi guys, wanted to uh, take a second and do another study tonight on um, uh, the MICA commentary. And as we've been talking about with these things, there is a whole lot of Dead Sea Scrolls that are just copies of Scripture. And sometimes I'll have an extra sentence or so, so that's interesting to, to look at. But we only have about half of it, and the vast majority is identical uh, to the Scripture we have. But then we have commentary, and sometimes the commentary will quote passages of Scripture that's not in the other. So we're trying to compile all that together. We would like to create a uh, PDF, at least, with the Scriptures, the Old Testament, what is actually there, half of it, um, what's different, and then commentary, uh, which there's not that much either, but there's enough that will make it really interesting. So um, we're, we're working on that. But this week I wanted to show you um, the Micah commentary. So to start off with that, let's look at um, um, our eSword. And here is the Micah commentary. And I just want to read probably the first um, six or eight verses and then focus on that, what the Dead Sea Scrolls say about it. So this is interesting. Micah, as you know, is a minor prophet, and we're talking about uh, a certain part in Jerusalem when um, um, the enemy is coming after it. Uh, they need to repent, but they're not going to repent, so there's going to be um, other things going on. And what's interesting is, again, the Dead Sea Scrolls and other Jewish writings give us the idea that uh, the prophets may have written other prophetic things. But if a prophet wrote something along the lines of so-and-so is going to have a bad crop failure in the next two days and or next year, and they either fixed it or didn't, but it has no bearing on end-time prophecy, then that wouldn't have been included in the canon. And the concept then is that everything in the canon has some sort of a bearing, every prophetic book, has some sort of a bearing on end time prophecy. And there are different pieces, though, uh, different the ends of different ages. So, for instance, in Micah chapter 5, we see the birth of the Messiah and the destruction of Israel. And then we also see Israel coming back the second time, which is 1948, and then eight wars that they would fight with Syria between 1948 AD and the second coming. And then there's other things in there also. There's uh, the prophecy of um, Jerusalem being plowed over, which happened in 71 AD, I believe. Um, so lots of interesting things in there. A lot of them that back then, a lot of them here. This particular chapter, chapter 1, you would assume is just a condemnation of what they're doing. And it probably has no bearing on end-time prophecy or on us other than if they're bad and we're bad in the same way, God didn't like what they did, he probably won't like what we're doing. So as an example type thing. But according to the Dead Sea Scroll commentary, there's just a little bit more to it than that. So let's read this. I think this is going to be cool. So this is Micah chapter 1. We'll just start off at verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Micah, the Morashite, in the days of Jothram, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. So there's a judgment or a word of knowledge of some sort about Samaria and about Jerusalem in the days of these kings. So he apparently had a vision and was continuing to tell them, like I told you before, it's coming. You need to be careful. Danger is coming. You need to be prepared for it. And they don't pay attention. So anyway, one thing I'd like you to point out or point out to you is this right here. Actually, let me see if I can bump that up. Be a little easier. That's better. Yeah, let me go to a full. I'm not prepared here. That looks better. Okay, anyway, the word of the Lord. We tend to take this for granted. The word of the Lord probably means he had a vision or something like that. The thing that we have to understand in John chapter 1, the Word was with God and the Word was God and the Word created everything. And then the Word was incarnated in human flesh in verse 14 and became the light of the world. 
So we're talking about Jesus being the Word. In this particular case, it doesn't mean, and some, sometimes they'll say an angel appeared, or I had a vision, or like in the book of Daniel, I went to sleep and I had a night vision, which is a dream. So all sorts of things can happen. But I want you to understand that he's saying, I didn't go to sleep and have a dream. I didn't see a vision. An angel didn't appear to me, either in reality or in a dream or a vision or anything. The word of the Lord came to me. This is a Christophany, or what we call a pre-incarnate appearance of the Messiah. You know how sometimes we have a really good feeling that the Lord's leading us to do something, and sometimes that's correct and sometimes it's not. Uh, sometimes we have a dream, and you know what the dream was. The, it's no doubt about that. But was the dream a word from the Lord, or was it just one of those things? In this case, he's not saying, I had a vision, I had a dream, I think. He's saying, I was doing something, I turned, and the pre-incarnate Messiah was standing right there. This is kind of like when Abraham saw the three men or the three angels coming and perceived that they're not men. That's what, that wasn't a dream that he had. That's something pretty specific. So this is really cool. I just want you to understand that whenever a minor prophet said, the word of the Lord came to me, that's the Messiah coming to him, pre-incarnate Messiah. So he comes to Micah the Morishite in those days. Okay. So then if we look down here, we have the um, bad news. Okay. So verse 2 says, Hear... All ye people, hearken, O earth, and all that is therein. Let the Lord God be witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. For behold, the Lord comes out of his place, and he will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. Now, a lot of times the Lord shows judgment, and normally a high place, that's a, an idiom for a pagan shrine, some place where they sacrifice children or animals to foreign gods or something like that. It's usually a really bad place. So, like a, a Rama is a high place where they sacrifice people, human beings. So, in this case, what's going on here is they're making this a symbol of something else. So, remember, like in the prophecy of... Uh, um, Rachel weeping for her children, and it was Rama. And so we're talking about, even though it wasn't a sacrificial um, thing where Herod sacrificed children to a foreign god for some purpose, it wasn't that at all. He just didn't want the king to be born, so he wanted to kill everybody. Well, the practicality, it's the same thing. His He wanted something other than to serve a god, but the same result occurred. And in this case, you're talking about high places, and that's usually someone who's doing a pagan rite, maybe sacrificing a person or, or something, doing something really horrible and abomination. And the Lord comes out of his temple. In other words, a whirlwind, uh, a flood, lightning, wind, hurricane, something like that, some form of judgment, and destroys them. And so that's that's happened before in Scripture. So that's the concept or the picture uh, being here. But what's interesting is they're going to kind of turn this around a little bit. The high places, what high places? What what are so horribly evil that they're pagan? At this point, there may not be anybody with, a, with an idol or killing little kids or anything like that. So what are we talking about? Verse 4 says, The mountains shall be molten to, under him, and the valleys cleft, <laughs> And like wax before the fire and the waters pounded in the deep or a steep place. So just like total destruction is what we're talking about. So for the transgression of Jacob is all this. In other words, this whole big thing where the Lord actually has to come out and destroy is because of Jacob's transgression. And for the sins of the house of Israel. So Jacob is Israel in general, the whole thing, Judah and Israel. Uh, the house of Israel would be the ten tribes. So then they ask the question, what is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? 
what are the high places of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? Now that's a really, we, we tend to gloss over this, but that's a really spooky thing. He's saying, just like I would feel if you were worshiping a foreign god and sacrificing babies to it, that, that should be totally abhorred to you. Okay, that's how I feel with what's going on in the Jerusalem temple and in Samaria. Maybe they're not doing that exactly, but it's how I feel. Much like they talk about uh, spiritual adultery is idolatry. And the concept is God is married to Israel. And how would you feel if you came home and found out your wife's been cheating on you? You know how you would feel. That's how God feels when you're supposed to be in a relationship with him and you're off worshiping a false god. It's like cheating on your spouse. That's that, that kind of a concept. So these are all, it's not symbolic or not real, but it's how you would feel with this. So they're doing something really, really bad to the point that God's going to have to judge them, destroy them. Um, and what is it? There's a transgression of Jacob and of Judah. So what are they? Samaria and Jerusalem. What's going on in Samaria and Jerusalem? Now, remember, Samaria is the capital of the northern tribes. When they broke, they started um, worshiping other gods. They made two calf, molten calf images, one in Dan and one in Bethel. And the king said, we don't want you going to Jerusalem to worship God. You come to these places and worship God. And of course, we understand the logic behind it is if you go pay your tithes in Jerusalem, that's like taking all of your tax that you would pay for the United States and giving it to, say, Mexico. Well, the United States wouldn't be so happy about that. So we need tax gatherers here in America, not in some other country. The money shouldn't be flowing out to another country. That makes sense as far as the tax goes. But the temple is the temple. And so to counter that, they actually created false temples with idols. And so in other words, they're going from bad to worse. That's a problem you need to fix because the government needs taxes, but you don't go against God to do that. And we tend to do the same thing now. We could talk a lot about what's going on now. Same kind of a problem. Um, but they don't really believe that God will do anything. And that's, that's the whole part problem there. So the high places are Judah, uh, are of Judah and Jacob, rather, are Samaria and Jerusalem. So that's really interesting. We'll come back to that. So verse 6 says, Therefore I will make Samaria a heap of a field like the plantings of a vineyard. You know, there's not any large crops or anything around. You just planted them. It looks like there's nothing there. I will pour down the stones thereof to the valley and I will discover the foundations thereof. Like if you had um, treasure in your basement that had been sealed up for centuries or whatever. Well, the enemy, knowing that, would literally tear it apart stone by stone until they find the treasure, you know, all the way down to the foundation. So when they're done, there's absolutely nothing left. It's totally destroyed. And so that's what they're going to talk about. Now, this is interesting. We'll look at the next couple of verses here. All the graven images thereof shall be beaten into pieces, and all the hires thereof shall be burned with fire. All the idols thereof I will lay desolate, for she gathered it as the hire of a harlot, and shall turn it to the hire of a harlot. Return, rather. So what we're talking about here is, and this would be literal in Micah's time, all the all the uh, people that worship idols, the idols are going to be destroyed, and all the people go into captivity. So everything will be destroyed. There will be no people there, no idols, no anything. What is really interesting, though, is the concept of idolatry. And you've probably heard people, maybe you went to church and you've heard people talk about how anything that you put in front of God is an idol. Uh, so in other words, this is more important than God. And that's kind of sort of true, but not exactly from a Dead Sea Scroll perspective. And let me explain the difference. Um, 
I, I heard a sermon not too long ago about how uh, football can be an idol. And the concept was if you stay home every Sunday because the football game, and you don't have time to go to church and do that both, whenever there's not a football game, you'll be in church for sure. But when there's a football game, I'm not going to go to church. So you've made a decision that the football is the f most important thing. Okay, and you're not anti-Christian. And when football is not around, the second most important thing is church. Okay, uh, sometimes we get our priorities backwards uh, in that sense. Sometimes uh, a guy can spend all of his time working so that he makes money for his family and never spends time with his family. And so that can cause a problem just as much as the guy that spends all his time with his family and doesn't work. There's got to be priorities somewhere. So they would say that that's idolatry. Now, what I think Paul meant, Paul said that greed can become idolatry. And I think there's a really fine line here. And this is we're going to see this in the, the Dead Sea Scroll commentary in a minute. But if I say, I love the Lord, and if the Lord put it on my heart to, to not watch football, that's what I would do. But right now he hasn't, so this is what I'm going to do. You're not saying that it's more important or a replacement. It's just a hindrance. Okay, so it wouldn't really be an idol in that sense, but a hindrance. But now if there was a conflict between where you had to choose to be one or the other, I'm either a Christian in church on Sunday morning or I'm a football fan at, uh, in front of my TV on Sunday morning. If you had to choose and you couldn't be both, then to choose the football would be an idol. So let me explain, and I'm not saying that's right or not, but this is the Dead Sea Scroll concept. So let me explain this. What they're going to do is they're going to throw it up and put it in modern day terms and basically say this. If you are waiting for the Messiah and you spend more time making money for your family and getting ready instead of reading the scriptures, you're still a believer. You're not making your family an idol, but you're making the family a distraction to what you should be doing. And so it's a distraction, but not idolatry. Now, the idolatry part comes in when you decide to be a Pharisee, for instance. So I'm a Jew. I believe. I, I work. I make money. I go to synagogue, I study, I'm doing everything right. But now there's a Pharisee, a Sadducee, and a scene. And I pick one of these. It's that old hatred concept again. So if I pick one of them and say, I think these two are wrong and I'm going with that one. God bless you all, but I believe this. That's fine. But when you decide these two are evil because of that, we have to destroy them that's when you cross that line. And the Dead Sea Scrolls then would say, you're making your theology an idol. So they would actually refer to the Sadducees and the Pharisees as idolaters, even though they would not touch an idol. So they're not a true idolater in the sense of having a little statue that they do a ritual with, but they're making their theology an idol. So in other words, the Messiah comes and says, here I am, the correct interpretation of Scripture is the Essene way. Pharisees and Sadducees that love the Lord, that are not doing this idolatry thing, are going to go, oh, I had that really wrong. Oh, well, anyway, what do I do? I become an Essene. Done. I become a Christian. I do what? I get baptized. Okay, whatever. Let's, let's do it. So, and I was wrong on this. I admit it. I changed my ways. It was a good guess on my part. My teachers were wrong, but you immediately, it, it's not a bad thing. You just had no, noticed you were wrong and you switch. But now the Pharisees and the Sadducees that say, no, we're not going to do that. That would be giving up our position and our authority and our money. We're not going to do that. But you recognize, like there's three different prophecies about the Messiah and they, they contradict each other. So one's got to be correct. The other two have to be wrong. You're, you're sure you're right. The Messiah comes and you're wrong. So instead of converting, which any logical person would do, just accept Messiah. That's all you got to do and repent of your sins. Whatever he says, do, do it. If he says, do something different, do something different. Just follow directions. It's not hard. 
But instead, they're going to say, no, it has to be my way, period. And if he's going to push and get in my way, I will have the guys get rid of him. We'll kill him. That kind of a thing. And that's exactly the Pharisee, Sadducee mentality back then. So you can understand the concept of the Messiah comes, proves himself. If you're going to fight against the Messiah, that's worse than any other kind of idolatry. So in other words, if someone told you you're supposed to bow and, and, and worship at a statue, Messiah comes and says, no, they were wrong, and you immediately, oh, okay, well, I'll stop then. Whatever Messiah says, that's a pure heart. You just need to repent. of we all, We've all sinned, and we've all misunderstood and thought we've had it right and went forward. So this is, this is really interesting to me, their concept of idolatry. So go to church every Sunday. You can record the, the uh, football game. So don't let it be a distraction. But then when we get in there and we start talking about stuff and say, like rapture, pre, mid, or post, we disagree. We'll find out when it happens. You know, I think I'm right, but you think you're right. That's fine too. But we don't attack each other. You know, and then the, say a pre-trib rapture happens and, and these guys say that couldn't have been the rapture because that's not what my theology teaches. It's that kind of concept that's making your theology an idol. So whether these guys had actual idols or not, they were obstinate and anti-God. Even though they thought, they probably really thought they were correct. I'm sure the Sadducees and the Pharisees all thought they were correct. Uh, but when presented with the evidence, they should have converted. Verse 8 says, um, and notice the concept of harlot in here too. That same thing of spiritual idolatry or idolatry being spiritual adultery doesn't actually have to be in real harlot. It doesn't actually have to be a real idol, but it's moving away from Messiah. Therefore, I will wail and howl, and I will go striped and naked. I will make a wailing like dragons and a mourning like owls. So like the demonic things. Her wound is incurable, for it is come into Judah. He has come to the gate of thy people, even Jerusalem. And it goes on and talks about the different cities that are doing things at that point. So let's stop at this point and look at the Dead Sea Scroll. So here is the Micah commentary. And uh, this is in 1Q14 and 4Q168. And just to remember, remind you guys, there's basically 11 uh, caves out of the 53 or 54 that were looked at that actually had written documents. So in cave one, that's what the 1Q14 is. It's uh, the 14th scroll that was cataloged out of the first cave in Qumran. So 4Q168 is going to be the 168th scroll that was cataloged in Cave 4 of Qumran years later when they discovered it. They're both pieces of mica. So let's just go through and read the commentary. So like most commentaries, it'll have the verses and then tell you what it means to them. So this is verses 5 and 6 that we just read. We don't have a 1, 2, 3, or a 4. So for 5 and 6, all this is for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of, of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? What is the high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? I will make Samaria a ruin in the fields and of Jerusalem a plantation of vines. So totally destroyed. But now look at this. This is pretty interesting. The interpretation concerns the sprouter of lies who led the simple astray. Now, at this point, obviously, there were people in the temple either being real idolaters or something leading people astray. Um, you know, you walk up to your pastor and say, where do you get that from Scripture? Why are you doing that? That seems to be sinful according to Scripture. You know, and you're told, oh, you just you don't know how to read Greek, Hebrew, and Latin. If you, if you did, you'd understand it. Just follow directions. You know, the, the sprouter of lies. 
leading people astray. So back then, but in their time period, which is the first century, there are people who lie about Messiah even before Messiah came. So this is going to be pointing to Pharisees and Sadducees with their theology. Remember, the Pharisees and the Sadducees had the theology that the Messiah was not God incarnate, like the Essenes taught. He's just a man, and he'll be a great general. He will destroy all the wicked people, leaving only Pharisees and Sadducees. He will destroy Rome, and the Pharisees and Sadducees will rule the world. Very egotistical. Um, the Essenes, on the other hand, said, no, that's not the way the old ones taught it. The old ones, the patriarchs, in the writings of the patriarchs, which are pre-Moses, um, they said the Messiah would be God incarnate. Don't ask us how that works, because it's not the Father, but somehow that works. But he comes for the purpose of dying to pay for our sin nature, the penalty for our sin nature. And that reconciles us to God. He's not here to destroy Rome or anything else for that matter. He's, he's, he's here to fix us. And that includes Rome, if they want to be fixed. Anybody that wants to repent and follow directions, he's here to fix that. And he dies to do that. Again, they probably would tell you, don't ask me how that works. That's just what's dictated. He's going to be born of a virgin. The Pharisees and Sadducees say, no, that's symbolic of something else. Like, no, it's literal. Uh, many scrolls say that. Um, so they're going to get to this point and follow Messiah or reject Messiah. So the sprouter of lies who led the simple astray. So today we have cults that say Messiah or Jesus was not God incarnate. He was just a man or he was an angel or he was something else. So again, it's one thing to be taught wrong um, according to what some of the scrolls are. And it's another thing to be teaching things that are wrong. So if you're part of a non-Trinitarian group, it doesn't mean you're not saved, you're not going to go to hell, or you are going to hell or whatever. You have a chance of studying and understanding. But when you have somebody or a group of people that say, I know Greek, Hebrew, and Latin, and I'm telling you a dog is a cat, they're deliberately lying, either by because they can't read Greek, Hebrew, and Latin, or they can read it and they're telling you a lie. There's no way they can say a dog is a cat. It's just not possible. So that's why we call them cults, because anybody that can read would know better. Uh, so the languages. And that's the constant teaching of the early church. So let's go on with this. This is interesting. So the high places of Jerusalem and Samaria, the sprouter of lies that lead the simple astray. We're supposed to be as wise as a serpent, but as gentle as a dove. So focusing on, they come back and focus on Micah 5, or 1, 5 rather. What is the high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? So what does that mean to them? Now the Jerusalem problem of idolatry, in whatever sense it was, or you know, multiple senses, in 700 BC is one thing, but it happens again in the similar way in their time period. So the Pharisees and Sadducees, how is that total idolatry? Okay, so this verse, they say, concerns the teacher of righteousness who expounded the law to his counsel and to all who freely pledged themselves to join the elect of God to keep the law of, in the counsel of the community who shall be saved in the day of judgment. So remember, we're told that the teacher of righteousness is Messiah. And the teacher of righteousness did come and die uh, about 40 years before the destruction of the temple. The temple was destroyed in 70 AD. So somewhere around 30, 32 AD, about 40 years before the destruction of the temple, is when the teacher of righteousness died. And he was put to death because of the words of the evil priest which is probably the same as the sprouter of lies. So we know we're talking about Messiah. So this is interesting. So the high place of Jerusalem becomes anti-Messiah. 
So this concerns the teacher of righteousness, the Messiah, who expounded the law to his counsel. So there was a kind of a Sanhedrin group of people who studied under Messiah. Uh, let's call them disciples or apostles. And they are sent out to teach the other people. Um, and so that's his counsel. So that's pretty interesting. So Jesus expounded the law, the truth, the, all the teachings to his apostles and to all who freely pledge themselves to join the elect of God. It's very, very important that you do that. You can't just, oh, Jesus saved me. That's nice. No, you have to accept Jesus Christ as your savior in order to become a Christian, in order to be saved. And you have to follow his teachings. What's moral is moral. What's not moral is not moral. You can't compromise. You don't attack people. You don't get mad. You simply follow the teachings. I had a friend that was doing something wrong, and the church asked him to, to leave, at least until he got the thing figured, you know, taken care of. It was a really weird situation, but he was sinning. Um, so anyway, um, he was upset, of course, and I tried to explain to him, I'm not even sure under your circumstances that that is a sin, but it looks like a sin. So none of us are condemning you. We're simply saying that according to scripture, we can't allow people to stay in church and look like they're sinning. So when you get that fixed, you're welcome to come back. Maybe we're totally wrong. It, uh, that is a possibility. But we want to live our life the way the Bible dictates or the way we think the Bible dictates. Okay. So in other words, instead of me judging him, I was trying to explain to him that if he gets mad at me for this, then he's actually judging me. He can do whatever he wants. But as a Christian, I want to stay away from people that do one, two, and three, and I want to get around people that do four, five, and six. And maybe I'm reading it wrong, but I'm trying with all my heart to live a holy lifestyle. And so when I explained it to him like that, he, he was basically, oh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm not saying you have to live my lifestyle. That's, that's fine. Um, so that, that helped out a lot. But you have to freely pledge yourselves to join the elect of God. That means do the things that they do and don't do the things that they don't do. Um, I mean, you're free to do anything, play baseball, watch football, do whatever, unless it's directly mentioned that it's sinful somehow. But now notice this. This is pretty interesting. Um, they freely pledged to themselves to join the elect of God to keep the law of the council of the community. So let me just do this here. The law of the council of the community. So the council of the community in a scene language is a scene theology. You're following directions, which they accept Messiah. So basically Christian theology to keep the law. Now, law is teaching, but a teaching is how you do something. If uh, you're making scrambled eggs in the kitchen and you're starting to put five times the amount of salt in it, it's going to taste horrible. So I need to come to you and say, here is a recipe. It's the law of how you make scrambled eggs. In that sense, I mean, it's whether you're doing it on purpose or not, don't make scrambled eggs that way. So you have to keep the law of the council of the community, which in this case is his council, the law of the apostles. So that's pretty interesting. And those that do this will be saved in the day of judgment. So do you want to be saved? Do you want to be a Christian? Do you want to spend eternity with, with uh, your loved ones, with God? Become a Christian. You don't have to do anything. You have to, as far as like certain works or whatever, but you have to follow directions. That seems like I'm saying the same thing backwards. But the concept of keeping the law is the, um, the attitude of the heart. So if I've never become an alcoholic and I drink because I think it's okay, and you tell me that's a sin you need to stop, okay, if my heart's pure, I just stop. And it's not a big deal because I'm not addicted to it, okay? But if I've become an alcoholic and I'm strongly addicted to it, 
I may still have the attitude of, okay, I'll try, but I may have a real struggle with it. Okay, so it's the attitude. It's not that I'm doing it perfectly, but it's my attitude of trying to do it perfectly, whether I ever get it fixed or not. But you can't, the one thing that you can't do is to say, I don't see it as a problem and I'm going to do what I want to do. The attitude of arrogance is the one thing that can't be tolerated. Messing up, not doing it right, but trying is perfectly fine if you're really trying. So in the, in the community rule, it talks about those that confess and, and join and, and repent and say they'll do it our way, but hold off in their heart thinking, I don't think that's that important. And when they're not looking, I'll just do what I want. If you have that attitude, you're not one of us. So it has to be a pure heart. And so that, again, de definitely goes against the Sadducees and the Pharisees. So, and that's all we have. That's all we have as far as the commentary in Micah 5 that I found so far. So out of these two scrolls. But what's really interesting then is to see that, number one, they believe the teacher of righteousness came that he died for our sins, that he created this council of his own, and that all of us that freely pledge ourselves to join the elect of God and obey the council uh, will be saved. That's how you're saved. And the sprouter of lies is the one who leads the simple astray. Don't be simple. Don't be, in other words, stupid. Uh, everything is simple. The scriptures say one, two, three, Maybe there's a couple of different ways of interpreting it. But when Messiah comes, he's either a man or a woman, you know, but black or white. He's either a general or he's God incarnate. He either dies for our sins or he doesn't die for our sins. So when he comes, it becomes obvious. So you know, Essene theology is correct. Sadducee, Pharisee theology is wrong. Just obey. Just freely pledge yourself to join the elect of God. And that's all there is to it. And then try to do, you know, as best as you can, what you're commanded to do. So I thought that was really interesting. And there's a lot more things like that. This, um, just as a side note, this teacher of righteousness is found in many places in the scrolls. And I didn't really realize it, but it's found, uh, different words are used and it's usually translated differently. But it's found in three or four places in the Minor Prophets. So it's really interesting to, to see they had a concept of the teacher of righteousness that we didn't. So anyway, and then there are derivatives of that, like the son of righteousness that arises with healing in his wings, uh, all pointing to Messiah. But the teacher of righteousness describes one thing about him. The son of righteousness describes something else. So anyway, we'll stop there for tonight. So let me go to the chat room and just see if we have any any comments. Okay. Got people here, uh, old friends from Denmark and from Texas and Utah, Oklahoma. That's interesting. Diane says uh, the NLT states in verse 1 1 that they came to Micah in the form of visions. Let's, let's look at that real quick, just out of curiosity. 1 1. The word of the Lord that came to Micah the Morishite. Yeah, it doesn't really say it is or is not. Of course, it's still, the word of the Lord could still appear to him in vision form. But it doesn't say anything like that. Let me let me look here at a couple others. A message from the Lord came to Micah. Um, that's ISV. Let's try. Septuagint says, oh, let's get this. Septuagint says, where the Lord came to Micah. 
Okay. Interesting. Yeah, they all pretty much just say, uh, let's try this one. The word of Adonai came to Micah. They said, yeah, it doesn't say anything about visions. That is really interesting. Most of the time we would assume it would be a vision, though. And let's see here. Okay. That's pretty interesting. And then one person says, um, I believe that Jerusalem and Samaria as high places refers to them being the capitals and where they worshipped. So that's true. But if they were doing what was right, it wouldn't be a problem. It would be great. So they're doing something wrong. And it seems like that happens everywhere. Whoever is ruling decides they can do whatever they want. And problems always arise. Very rarely do you have someone like the heart of David that says, I'm the king, we will do exactly what I say. Now, I'm, I'm not the top of the line here. I'm going to go ask God what he wants me to do. And I'm just going to follow directions. So you don't have people like that very often. In our country, the concept is um, that we have the freedom to worship uh, the way we want uh, or the way we feel like we're led and that the Constitution is the highest form of law. And so it's rare to have someone like Ronald Reagan or President Trump or people like that that say, we're going to follow the Constitution or the Supreme Court. Supreme Court usually tries to interpret the Constitution pretty well, but they tend to get off every so often, uh, which every group does, I suppose. But that whole concept... Uh, we have rights by our creator, and that can't be abridged or taken away in any form. And that has to be remembered. And it's really easy for people to say, well, in this one case, if we do this, it will help people. Maybe it would, but it's illegal. You know, and so it's really hard. And they had the same thing. They had the Torah and the law, and it was specific, but they decided it would be better if they did it a different way, and you can't do that. Yeah, Jeanette says, um, pray for her eldest son, Patrick, who um, has tested positive for corona. So we'll definitely do that. And then two-year-old granddaughter, yeah, would be at high risk at that point, yes. Okay, we will definitely add you to our prayer group. Okay, and they're staying at home isolated, Okay. Well, we'll pray that they don't have it, and if they do, that it's very, very mild. Yeah, using prayers and zinc. Yeah, if you can get the hydrox... Maybe I shouldn't say that on YouTube. If you can get the you-know-what and some zinc and other things, that might help too. Okay, definitely. All right, it looks like that's, we didn't have too many comments or anything. Um, as far as things that are going on, we're looking at kind of expanding or changing things around a little bit. We'll probably talk more about that Thursday, um, just to make everything work better and guard ourselves from getting in trouble and being able to say whatever it is we, we want to say. Um, let's see here. Not sure what's it. okay. Oh, it. Yeah, and that's true. It's a lot of times it's simple, and we tend to make it harder than it should be. That's absolutely true. You you have things you're supposed to do and not supposed to do, so try your best. And if you need help, get in with groups of other brothers and sisters. 
that would help a lot too. Pray with each other, do things like that. So good, very good point. Why would the people of the whole earth need to be concerned if it is only Israel who's having idol issues? Is this a future prophecy or did it already happen? I think that the concept is both, at least from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, back then it was just them having idol problems. Uh, but the concept is, uh, I think, if you know you're supposed to worship the one true God, he doesn't like idols, he doesn't want you getting drunk or hurting yourself or, or killing people, etc. And maybe you put the idols down, but you do the other things. Or maybe you have the idols, but you put some of the others down. No matter how you do it, if you do one, two, and three, and I do four, five, and six, somebody else does the opposite or some other mixture of them, none of us are doing right. And I think that's the, that's the point. And they're saying it's actually not that hard. It's fairly simple. We're all sinners. We're waiting for Messiah to come and fix it. If we're wrong in our theology, when he comes, we're going to just do what he tells us. And if you can stand there and say, I refuse, that's the unpardonable sin. Refusing Messiah, just follow directions. And what they're saying is the Pharisees and the Sadducees may not have had anything to do with actual idols, but they um, had some form of idolatry in their theology. That's really important, I think, for us to get because I've had friends that were hyper Calvinist they would say there's no way that Israel coming back as a nation and doing those things could have a bearing on end time prophecy because if they did, that would mean we're not their replacement, they're still here, and our whole theology would fall apart. So no matter how it looks, it has to be a coincidence. God can't be in it. And that's the same kind of a thing. I'm not saying the Calvinists are bad or going to go to hell or anything like that. I'm just saying it's that kind of a concept. It's like, but my theology dictates, therefore, that must be wrong. You know, that kind of a thing. And so we've just got to be real careful of that. Um, we should focus on repentance uh, in everything. You and I all do have mess up once in a while. The arrogance is the main problem. If we can just get rid of arrogance, like in the Old Testament, circumcision is uh, a ritual done in the flesh to make you remember the circumcision of the heart. And all that means is to get rid of the arrogance. If your pastor or someone comes and says, you need to do this, we, first you need to check it by Scripture, but if it looks plausible, you need to follow directions. So it's the same like if, uh, if our governor or president says you need to do this, if it matches, if it doesn't go against the Constitution, they're an authority, we need to try to do it. Maybe we won't do it that well, but we need to try. Um, if someone tells you to disobey Scripture, disobey the Constitution, we can't do that. So, But I think that's, uh, in, in that sense, it is, a, um, it was, ancient in their time for 700 BC. It was first century at the first coming of Messiah. And the whole concept is that toward the end of our age, which is now, uh, you're going to have the same kinds of things. So in the church, people will begin to do that with little things that don't really matter. But that concept will keep coming. And that's why we need to preach repentance and um, uh, the circumcision of the heart, the humility, in other words. That needs to be it. So if you really think I'm wrong, then don't do it. And if, if I really feel strongly about it, maybe you and I shouldn't fellowship, but we shouldn't try to come against each other. If one of us is wrong, maybe both of us are wrong in a certain point, but we need to try to figure it out if it's important. Let's see here. Idols are everywhere, and all we have, see, we all have natural issues with something becoming an idol. Yeah, that's true. And that's the whole thing. Um, and again, I think the Dead Sea Scrolls would kind of split a hair and say, maybe it's all considered idolatry, but it's, um, it's one thing to 
make something more important temporarily than God because you have to do something, make money or whatever. That's bad, but that's not the horrible part of idolatry. But the horrible part would be my theology is right, whether it has an idol in it or not, and I refuse to be corrected. And that's the dangerous part. Oh, yeah. Please don't forget to hit the like button. Great. Okay, well, this is, we got actually got done early, but we had a couple of good questions. But I just think it's neat to see these things and the same kind of stuff over and over again in the commentaries. So in this case, we already have part of the Micah uh, in the regular scripture, so that didn't help us add to the scripture part. But we got the commentary, and again, they're looking at the minor prophets as referring to back then when they wrote them, the problems in their day, and the end of our age. And there might actually be times in between, too. Because if you look at the flood, whatever happened in the flood, that was horrible. Very, very bad. Or the whole world wouldn't have been destroyed. But that was in 1656. So it was another 500 years before the end of the flood, or end of the age, rather. And that the same thing happened again. We have Nimrod with his um, religion and his tyranny in government. And according to Josephus and Jasher and several of the other scrolls, um, he instituted a, a different religion. And I don't think it's not really important what he did. It's just that he did something different. You worship one God with a pure conscience and await Messiah. If you're going to say you are Messiah, then you're, you're done. You know, and whether he actually said he was a messiah or not, I don't know. But he instituted different ways of worship, different other things, tyranny. And when Abraham came against him, his first and only thought was to kill. I will kill him. And again, that's the problem. You know, if you're really God and your religion is correct, why don't you just show it by doing things that are right? The rest of us will follow you and the evil person would fade away. You don't really need to kill so if you have to run around killing everybody, there's something wrong with your government. So it's it's the same thing. Okay. Um, Galatians 1.8. We can take a second and look at that here. Oh, wait, I'm in the wrong spot. If we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we've preached, let him be accursed. Yeah, that's a great example. And so if the gospel is one thing, but you're going to change what Christ is or what he did, or you can do something different or whatever, we just need to follow the directions of the New Testament. If we're confused, that's one thing. The Lord can guide us, but we can't be obstinate. And I have friends in all the different denominations that are that way. I have Baptists that won't talk to Nazarenes, Nazarenes that won't talk to Baptists because we're slightly different. Just like, that's crazy. Because that's one thing that the world sees, is that we're so fragmented, and we're supposed to show the love of Christ. If you're a Christian, you're a Christian. And we're supposed to be able to help, help each other. Okay, well, let me go ahead and stop here at this point, and we will come back Thursday and do a Q&A. And um, hopefully I'll have some um, information about what we're doing and um, censorship and stuff like that. Hopefully we can talk a little bit about some of that stuff and see where we go from here. But anyway, we're going to keep broadcasting on YouTube as long as they let us and uh, keep working with the scrolls and other things. So we will see you uh, Thursday. God bless you guys.